My name is Laura Nelson. I am the chair of the Center for Korean Studies. And on behalf of the Center for Korean Studies, the Institute of East Asian Studies, um, and Beverly, what is the Center for, German Center for German and European Studies? I'd like to welcome you um, to the Divided Nations and Their Neighbors Paths to Reconciliation um, workshop. So, um, Bev I just, I'm just going to say very briefly when um, Beverly Crawford brought this idea um, to me in, um, in the late spring, early summer this past year, I was so excited by the idea. I was, first of all, excited to find someone who was really interested in um, division. And um, I have this strange history of having studied in East Germany and taught in Korea. And, um, and I'm just fa I became interested in divided nations. There are a number of fascinating um, and important important political, economic, cultural um, issues around national division and history that we're going to be exploring over the next several hours. Um, and I think that it's a really apt time for this, in particular given um, the political discussions that are going to be going, be going on tomorrow. Um, with China and Taiwan. Um, so before we get going, I'm going to, um, Beverly's going to set the intellectual um, tone for the conference, but I just want to um, first of all thank um, our institutional sponsors, the Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco, the German Academic Exchange Service, the Institute of the Humanities for Unification of Kongguk University in Korea, and the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in San Francisco. Without their support and assistance, this could not have been possible. Um, and I also want to um, acknowledge what I'm sure all of you have experienced, which is the extremely capable, warm, um, smart, uh, efficient uh, logistical support of um, Caverly Carey, Assistant Director of Program Planning in um, the Institute for East Asian Studies, and Stephanie Kim, the Program Director of the Center for Korean Studies. They've worked um, countless hours and done an amazing job with the logistical work. Um, so, given um, given that given the support for wh which we have received for this um, experience, I want to bring um, Beverly up here so that she can give us a little bit of a framework for what we will be doing today. Thank you. Laura, thank you, and thank you for helping to get this off the ground. Um, we, of course, are meeting at a very propitious time. May I ask all the speakers to speak into the mic because it's being recorded. Um, tomorrow, the two leaders, China and Taiwan, are meeting for the first time since 1949. So we have in action divided nations and maybe a path to reconciliation. We will, we will see. Um, also, on November 9th, just a few days from now, we will celebrate the 26th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, an event which ended not only the division of Germany, but also the division of Europe and many divisions in the world. And so what we have is sort of the beginning, hopefully, of a reconciliation process in action, we can see tomorrow, and, and we see the, the end of, of a divided nation in just a few days. We'll celebrate the end of a divided nation because the reason why we wanted to do this conference is because we have noticed in our three institutes and centers that divided nations can foster tremendous international instability and conflict. And if you look at the Korean demilitarized zone, which I toured a couple of years ago, and the Taiwan Strait, they, they do remain some of the most crucial global hotspots today. Um, and internally, the politics of, of, the, of, United, of divided nations are really colored and impregnated with division and its conflicts and contradictions. So we want to look at how divided nations have caused instability, how, how reconciliation and unification has helped temper instability, and we will look at Germany. Germany 
first is the um, is probably the poster child for division and unification in in Europe at least. And Germany's path to reconciliation and unification has been for many uh, an inspiration in Asia. But can that process be replicated? And we're not going to answer that question today, but we're going to certainly address it. So our speakers who I have to say, we are world-renowned experts on this issue, many world-renowned experts on Germany, on Korea, on Taiwan and China, and some have expertise in both Asia and Europe and Germany. And we're extremely fortunate to have them today to speak to us. And I want to charge them all with uh, attempting to address the following questions. We've set the bar pretty high, but they're up to it, I think, all of them. Um, is reconciliation possible or even desirable in nations that have been divided by war and revolution? That's the first question. Is there a possibility of reconciliation between divided nations in the absence of unification. Um, is unification desirable even? Maybe reconciliation is as far as we want to go to bring about peace and stability and, and a kind of lightening of the political culture of divided nations. So then what role do political leaders and civil society play and external actors play in both division and reconciliation. Can, who can best knit together divided nations? And who can best work to reconcile their conflicting interests? What role do these domestic politics and culture play in helping or hindering um, unification and reconciliation? And finally, is there a viable counterpart to Germany's Ostpolitik, its, its policy of reconciliation in Europe. Is there a vi viable counterpart to Germany's Ostpolitik in Asia? So with that and with those questions, which our speakers will address in various ways throughout the day, I want to begin the first panel which is on regional stability and instability and divided nations. Um, so let me introduce our panel members. Just, I want to introduce them just briefly without short shrifting their impeccable and incredible credentials. Uh, but I want to first introduce Professor Fania Oz Salzberger from the University of Haifa, she is a professor of law and she is also affiliated with Haifa's Center for German and European Studies. And she is, has written uh, a lot on German-Israeli relations and spoken a lot on German-Israeli relations. And she just published a book called Jews and Words, which I finished just finished reading. Um, and it's wonderful. I totally recommend it to everyone. And secondly, next to her here is Eric uh, Langenbacher. And Eric is a, is a visiting assistant professor at Georgetown University. He is a political scientist. He has written on numerous topics on Germany. He's a, he's a real expert on, on Germany. And he's working now on the question of collective memory. I think he's working on a longer project on collective memory in Germany, and his paper today will, will focus on German foreign policy. And then we have Professor Sungmin Kim from Konkuk University in, in Korea, and he, he is, has looked at theories of division systems, and he is going to be talking to us today about um, how assist how division of, of nations is part of a of a larger system, and then we have Professor uh, Shou Cheng Teng, 
who is has whose phone has been ringing off the hook these days to speak on the on on the meeting this this historic meeting between the two leaders he is he is an expert in both german matters and in ex, an expert in china he got his phd in the university of bonn and he is an expert on East Germany and this process of Ostpolitik and, and reconciliation. And so I'm really looking forward to all of these speakers. And then we have, and I will introduce him more fully um, later this afternoon, Professor Stefan Haggard from the University of California at San Diego. And Stefan got his PhD here at Berkeley. And is an expert in international relations, so that means everything in every part of the world, <laughs> and, and comparative politics, and has recently been writing on North Korea. He has a very interesting blog on North Korea called Witness to Transformation, and he has just public, he's just coming out with a book on, on North Korea, which we'll talk about more later this afternoon. So without further ado, uh, I think I will chair this panel. Each speaker should speak about 20 minutes. Um, and we'll try to keep you on time. This is a very long conference. Um, we crammed everything into one day. And so we're hoping to keep things short and precise and getting to the point. So our first speaker then is Professor Oz Salzberger. Much. First of all, let me make sure that everybody can hear me. Is this more or less the right volume, right distance from the microphone? And secondly, and importantly, I'd like to thank you, Beverly, and your colleagues, and of course, Kaverly and her staff, for this wonderful invitation. I just told Professor Gardner Feldman that I flew from exactly the other side of the world to be here this one day. I arrived last night. I'm leaving tonight. And I think it's well worth it even though the journey is more than double the time that I'll be spending here. It's well worth it because, as I will shortly be saying in brief, the case of Israel and Germany, and I will make it triangular in a way, Israel, Palestine, Germany, is so unique that perhaps it is incomparable, but I'm not sure that it is incomparable. And I think that if there is any solution to the Israel-Palestine situation, it amounts to thinking out of the box and perhaps looking at other cases by way of comparison. I think that the Israeli-German case can offer a model to other countries and culture working on historical reconciliation. I think the Israeli-Palestinian case can learn from other models if it is able to listen to them humbly. And so I'm here not just to tell my own narrative, but also to listen humbly. So as said, to begin with, the Israeli perspective, and I'll be obviously speaking about the German case, and there will be other papers about the German case later today, but I will also bring in the Israeli perspective, is first and foremost unique. It is unique within the German Jewish realm of experience and memory. Because the mass murder, the genocide of Jews by Germany during the Nazi regime, and especially during the Second World War, was unique in its enormity. It is unique, or at least extreme, in the emotional, ongoing emotional impact it still has. It is unique, and I will dwell on that briefly, on the historical intimacy between the two nations involved. It is unique, or at least very special, in the long and successful process of conciliation. And it is, of course, unique in the sense that if our conference is about divided nations and reconciliation, and if Israel and Germany were once upon a time very divided nations prior to conciliation, Today, it is not Israel and Germany which are the divided nations. Quite the opposite, they are very close. It is Israel and Palestine, where division has be, had become enormous and indeed monstrous. And if anyone still entertains the notion that the Israeli-Palestinian field of crisis has nothing to do 
with the Holocaust, with the memories of Nazi Germany, they are, of course, direly mistaken because the Holocaust resides in so many different layers of the Israeli-Palestine-Israeli-Arab conversation to date. And so I will be dwelling on many uniquenesses, but I will attempt to conclude well within 20 minutes, if I make it, if not a polite reminder would not go un unheeded. Um, I will conclude with a few suggestions at universalities, lessons to be drawn by other parts of the world and not just by uniquenesses. So, of course, the first uniqueness is the enormity of the Nazi genocide of Jews, of course, other nations as well, but there is a well-founded uh, uh, case for the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And when I speak about the enormity of what happened between the years, I, I will spread out a little bit, 1935 to 45, although the mass murder itself only began in the early 40s, what happened in that decade has stamped itself upon global memory, global culture, and indeed human consciousness as such, all the way from poetry to philosophy to ethics, uh, including the ethics of science and international relations. Which is why when I speak of post-Holocaust Israelis and Germans, and by extension Jews and Germans, I have subtitled my paper the first 70 years because in some ways we are only just beginning to work on it. Some of my German friends and colleagues, including very well-meaning German friends and colleagues, think that the time has come for so-called normalisierung or normalization of the German Jewish memory since we are now almost three generations away from the time of the um, uh, the murderers and the victims. Not so, not so. There will not be a normalizing within the time of my children or grandchildren, I suspect. What we do encounter today in the, from the beginning of this millennium is a new abnormality. I call it in my German uh, lectures, die neue Unnormalität between Israelis and Germans, Jews and Germans. It is here to stay and to be reworked and reconsidered and reflected upon and the basis for great creativity, by the way, in generations of Jews and Germans to come. Emotionality. This runs very deep indeed. I grew up in an Israel in the 1960s, 70s, in which no one wanted to hear the German language, let alone to speak it, even like people like my own mother-in-law who were born and bred in Germany, spoke beautiful German from her home in Frankfurt. No way did the language ring in her everyday life. There were German books on the shelf, but nobody, hardly anyone translated literature from German to Hebrew with a few notable exceptions such as Erich Kessner and Karl May, but these were children's books, beloved ones, by the way. And um, nobody bought products from Germany. My family does not buy Siemens to this day because the said mother-in-law and her sisters were slave workers for Siemens in the Ravensburg concentration camp. But of course, other products from Germany are today very popular in every Israeli home. So there was a deep running emotionality. And strangely enough, this emotional sense of total nullness, of stunned silence, of boycott, has receded over the years, became a more sophisticated nationality. I will quickly read part of a memorable poem by the Hebrew, great Hebrew poet Nathan Alterman about the German legacy as it rang in Israeli Jewish ears in the early 1950s, my translation into English, and I read, Alive are the Nibelungen, fire, darkness, and Juden rein. In the battlefields fall the Jungen, Und ruhig fließt der Rhein. This is, of course, quietly flows the Rhein from the famous poem by the German Jewish poet Heinrich Heine. Um, each, each the battalions are riding, but they know that the day is near. Other rivers will flow plur, pure and tidy, but the Rhein will stay red, never clear. This is a new Lorelei for post Holocaust Jews. 
And the Rhine tells us Nathan Alterman will always remain red for us, while other rivers will become clean again. Um, he was wrong. The poem was titled The Liberation of Lorelei. He was wrong because today, or um, certainly um, in the last 15 years, hundreds of thousands of Israelis visit Germany as tourists. And by the way, also hundreds of thousands of Germans, especially young Germans, have come to Israel. Over the last decades, their number grew steadily. So that we are now talking about, in conservative estimates, well over half a million Israelis have been to Germany on tourism, business, and study. Um, the inflet, tourism influx both ways is steadily growing by as much as 8% per annum. Uh, thousands of Israelis permanently reside in Berlin. I wrote a book about it, an early book titled Israelis in Berlin already 15 years ago. German visitors, products, cultural artifacts are commonplace in Israel. There are great scientific relationships, academic exchanges, and so on and so forth. What is left of Altaman's bloody Rhine? And the preliminary answer is that a great deal has changed. The Rhine does not flow red for us, but a lot has persisted as well. Israelis have not normalized their relation to Germany. Rather, we are witnessing a new type of abnormality. The main thrust of my ongoing research work, which I will only very briefly lay out here, speaks of a four stages process between Germany and Israel. And at some point, by the way, it becomes a process not so much between Germany and Israel as between Germans and Israelis. That is, civil society and the individual realm has been taking over from governmental decision-making and governmental policies. The governments are still up and running, of course, but today it's Tel Aviv and Berlin talking to each other directly in thousands of different ways, artistic, academic, people to people, erotic, you name it, over the heads of the countries. And sometimes when the governments are experiencing tension, as is the case today, by the way, between Angela Merkel's government in Germany and Benjamin Netanyahu's government in Israel, ordinary people are creating a far more viable, interesting, creative, and friendly exchange between them. So this is something which I'm not sure whether I should uh, um, put in the slot of unique or perhaps universalizable, but it's the ordinary people who are doing the most important job. Young people, artists, creative types, a lot of Israelis in Berlin and Germans in Tel Aviv are creative types of different uh, 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 arts and occupations from great musicians like Daniel Barnboim, all the way to uh, video artists and uh, DJs, you name it. By the way, it is a wonderful ground for research because it brings me to all sorts of clubs and uh, concerts and semi-secret encounters, and so on and so forth. But it did not look like that in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The first stage from 1945 all the way to 1961 is what I call in my study um, absorption in two senses of the term. One sense is, of course, the immigration to the new founded state of Israel of hundreds of thousands of refugees. These refugees came from Nazi Europe, the uh, survivors of the Holocaust, but they also came as refugees from North Africa, from present day Iraq, from Yemen and elsewhere in the Arab world. Israel was busy creating, inventing, establishing itself, looking inside, trying to reinvent a nation to unite all these refugees, and at the same time accommodating about 600,000 Arabs who became willy-nilly Israeli citizens, and a similar number finding themselves as new Palestinian refugees outside of the border. So we have a kind of a multi-refugee situation, and a new nation absorbing and creating the traumatized hundreds of thousands of remnants from what had been the European Jewish world. 
The second stage, and the first stage, of course, is absorption also in the sense that um, the process of understanding what happened in the Holocaust, the enormity, the monstrosity of it all, it all is slow, is on ice. People don't talk about it much. They do talk about it, but not that much. There is no organized cultural re reworking and awareness. It's too early for that. Then we come to the second stage, which is the stage of shock, of heightened awareness, opening with the Eichmann trial in 1961. And the Adolf Eichmann abduction in Argentina and trial in 1961 in Jerusalem, which became the mainstay for all Israeli Holocaust and much of the Jewish Holocaust memory thereafter, orchestrated by the state, but immediately filtered into a plethora of private understandings and reworkings from Hannah Arendt onwards. This shock encounter, extremely well organized, of course, Arendt thought it was a mock trial. I do not think it was a mock trial. Myself, same mother-in-law, Lotte Salzberger, was a witness, indeed a key witness in the Eichmann trial. She had met Eichmann personally during the Holocaust. It was not exactly a mock trial, although it was very public and very symbolic. But this indeed launched the second phase of heightened, shocked awareness that flowed all the way into the late 1970s. And with this, within this state of heightened shocked awareness, the greatness of both Israeli and German leaders at the time was that not four years had passed since the Eichmann trial and Konrad Adenauer's Germany and Ben-Gurion's Israel reestablished diplomatic relationship. This was an act of heroism to some degree on both sides. I need to move on and I move on to the next of my four stages which is the late 1970s, the 1980s, individual engagement. We already have in place all the big state and educational and school ceremonies, but now individual Israelis from the second generation, writers like David Grossman, musicians, filmmakers are beginning to create and to create very deeply and beautifully. And the fourth and last, and I need to be uh, faster, the fourth and last is the current huge wave of travel both directions, but especially Israelis to Germany, individual encounters, intensification of human to human relations, and a great deal of new creativity. What can we glean from this success story of the German-Israeli conciliation? I'm not sure I can call it reconciliation, but I can call it a conciliation. First of all, in some respects, it has left out Palestine, and indeed, not only has it left out Palestine, it has also, in my mind, made, I'm sorry, made the Israeli-Palestinian rhetoric far worse, especially in recent years. Holocaust rhetoric, and may I say, because I'm not a representative of my government, I can say Holocaust rhetoric, often at its cheapest, has entered into diplomatic and political sphere of, of conversation in a way that distances Israelis and Palestinians even worse, even more. By accusing Palestinians and other enemies of Israel, such as Iran, of echoing the Nazis, our government, I would not like to get too personal here, but our government is both, in my mind, mind of many of my colleagues, abusing Holocaust memory and also creating the, Israel, the Jewish Arab rift in a far deeper and metaphysical, meta-historical, uh, onto a meta-historical path, which is, to put it extremely briefly for Bev's sake, not a very good idea. On the other hand, the Holocaust is present and can be positively present in the Israeli-Arab discussion, simply by means of showing that both sides are victims of colonialist Europe, and especially of Nazi Germany, both sides, not just the one. What else is, and I'll very briefly sum up and wrap up, what else is universal about this unique route of Israeli-German conciliation? What can be extended to other parts of the world? I think it is a shame in a way that there has been no Eichmann trial, no comparable one big historical moment of reopening the memory and sorting and putting in order facts and narratives and fears and hopes. 
but it is not too late to open up what in the Israeli-German case has been an extremely successful, honest conversation involving all sides. This is not about forcing nations to love one another. This is not about removing walls willy-nilly, whether both sides want it or not. It's not about the physical walls or borders. It is certainly about a heightened sense of mutual honesty involving not only government, but the hugely important people-to-people -people encounter. Cultural intimacy, historical familiarity is not only the case of Jews and Germans. I think many other divided nations in the world do share a cultural intimacy. At its worst, this is only heightening the bitterness because people who are so much alike us are our greatest enemies. But in other ways, it can also offer a bridge for a truly deep and honest discussion. And of course, as has been the case in the Israel-German, and also, by the way, in the Israel-Palestinian sphere of dialogue, a tremendous trigger for new cultural, scientific, academic, and especially artistic creativity. Thank you very much. I had a little bit of a glasses malfunction this morning, so I'm feeling a little discombobulated. But in any case, uh, so my paper is looking at collective memory in German foreign policy. And kind of the uh, working question is whether collective memory still influences German foreign policy today or not, or perhaps to the same degree as before. Uh, it would be very difficult for me to think about a country that has been more influenced by the past in uh, almost all policy areas, foreign policy, of course, first and foremost. Uh, in fact, uh, scholars like Lily Gardner Feldman, who's with us uh, today, talks about how reconciliation, the attempt to overcome the historical legacy, was reason of state. Uh, another historian talked about the German basic law, uh, its constitution, to be the anti-constitution to the Third Reich, um, another historian, a little bit more controversial, Manfred Kitto, argues that coming to terms with the past was the leitmotif of the entire post-war system in Germany. So just pervasive influence, and uh, over time we see <clears throat> just how often this uh, attempt to come to terms with the past and to construct a culture of contrition, as many people put it, is one of the most important markers of uh, post-war German history. But the last few years, Uh, the last few years have seen some foreign policy decisions or trends that uh, indicate that the power of the past, the power of this contrite collective memory may be waning. Uh, there's some evidence that Germany is, well, according to some people, finally becoming a normal power again, where interests of state, where self-interest in the very kind of realist sense of the word are um, having an influence on policy decisions that we just never really saw before. All right, so I get into a lot of this in the paper, but uh, what I want to stress quickly is that I'm looking at the impact of the past, and of course it's very difficult always to, uh, to uh, uh, identify uh, the impact of the past and not the impact of other factors as well. So I'm, I'm trying to create a preponderance of evidence to make a case for the impact of the past and how that may have uh, declined over time. So what I'm looking at briefly, and hopefully in a larger project in more detail, uh, is the impact in the foreign policy of a variety of chancellors and a variety of foreign ministers. So I thought that I would put all the information in a couple of nice um, tables uh, just to show you the people that I'm looking at. I also briefly look at some German presidents. The German president is, of course, a figurehead, but a figurehead with a lot of kind of symbolic power at times. And indeed, quite a few German presidents have made uh, very important statements uh, and contributions to this culture of contrition, including the recently deceased Gregor von Weizsäcker, as well as the first president, Te Theodor Heuss, and now, of course, Joachim Gauck. Uh, very kind of uh, important individuals. But that's a lesser focus than the foreign ministers and especially the chancellors. Now, the other thing that I do too, this is kind of the big takeaway. Um, 
I spent some time looking at uh, two different kind of vectors. The first is how salient memory is for a variety of policymakers. And then more importantly, I think, is what I call the conservative and the progressive memory stance. Uh, one of the more underappreciated authors uh, is a woman named Anne Sada, who's at Dartmouth. She has this uh, wonderful book where she talks about truth, justice, reconciliation, democratization, and she talks about two strategies to deal with the past, what she calls an institutionalist strategy, which is a kind of go slow strategy where you don't really bring up except in generalities, uh, what happened before, where you kind of let people be, you let them heal, but you have constructed good democratic institutions that will eventually, over time and with generational replacement, will remake the political culture. And then she contrasts that to what she calls a culturalist strategy. The culturalist strategy is about a deep form of kind of repentance and reconciliation, where there are one-on-one -on -one confrontations between perpetrators, victims where there's a kind of cleansing discursively and then eventually a kind of remaking of the values and a deeper form of trust and reconciliation. And I think that actually maps very, very closely to what I call the progressive and the conservative memory stances. All right. Um, so uh, going through these policymakers quickly, in the uh, larger bold uh, letters, I have uh, the chancellors. And then in the smaller kind of italicized, I have the uh, foreign ministers. And I mean, I guess I would just, we don't have time to go through uh, all of these, but let me just uh, highlight a couple. Karl Adenauer, the first post-war chancellor, uh, is a very kind of curious fellow, one might say, because he, he certainly epitomized this conservative memory stance, kind of letting the past be, actually uh, issuing some amnesties uh, uh, so that a lot of people who were convicted by the Allies were actually allowed to go back into uh, professional life and everything like that. On the other hand, he also started the negotiations that led to the Luxembourg Agreement, the first kind of compensation and restitution agreement in the early 1950s. Uh, and he certainly was an anti-Nazi. Actually, more importantly, he was anti-Prussian. And so, uh, yeah, he tried to remake Germany in that respect as well. Um, Kiesinger is also an interesting chancellor, uh, only in power for three years between 66 and 69. Uh, he was the only chancellor to be a former Nazi party member. Very controversial. Um, obviously a very kind of uh, conservative uh, person, but somebody who also tried to just not talk about the past and things like that. Uh, it was only with the new uh, uh, social liberal government after 1969 that we saw progressive memory politics really come into play. And I think Brandt, Willy Brandt, the kind of great legendary social democratic chancellor, uh, is probably the best example of a very progressive memory politics and also somebody who kind of highlighted it. And in fact, this new Ostpolitik that Bev mentioned uh, at the uh, outset was very much his baby, was very much his idea, his way of trying to make amends uh, for the past, especially with the countries that had been victimized the most. Well, okay, that's difficult to put or, or awkward to put it that way, but with countries that had really suffered under uh, Nazi uh, hegemony in the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, Brandt is the kind of person who talked about daring more democracy. I'm playing with this new idea of a second transition to democracy in many countries, decades after the first, this kind of deepening of democratic institutions and practices. And I think that, that Brandt was really trying to do something like that. Uh, Jeffrey Herf is another um, historian who's done very interesting work in this area. And he talked about, for Brandt, daring more democracy meant more memory, more justice, that these became mechanisms with which the country be could become more transparent and more fully democratized. Uh, what's interesting to kind of go ahead is that Joschka Fischer, the first green foreign minister between 98 and 2005, is probably um, right behind Brandt in terms of somebody who took memory, uh, coming to terms with the past very seriously, and uh, you know whose policy pronouncements were very much imbued with these considerations. In fact, 
Fisher is always my go-to person when I want, you know, to win an argument about this kind of stuff. Uh, Fisher talked about how Germany should support the Eastern expansion of the European Union as a duty due to crimes that Germans had committed there uh, many uh, decades before. So Fisher and Brandt kind of epitomize the kind of progressive, high memory salience uh, stance. Uh, so why don't I talk about the two most recent chancellors very quickly, uh, Merkel and Schroeder. Uh, Schroeder is somebody who I think really did want to start to relativize the past a little bit. He talked about the German way. He talked about, well, he was uh, careful not to say pride, but that he was very comfortable with contemporary Germany and stuff like that. On the other hand, he also supported the by now institutionalized uh, contrite memory stance. And when it was attacked here and there, he actually would defend it, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the end if I have some time. And then finally, we have Merkel. It's kind of hard for me to, and well, I, I was going to say that Merkel hasn't been around that long, but actually she just uh, celebrated her 10th uh, anniversary in power. But Merkel's a very amorphous politician, and so it's difficult sometimes to discern what her stances actually are. I think that she certainly um, is continuing to express support for this institutionalized memory stance, but she doesn't bring it up when she doesn't have to, if I could put it that way. And I also think that she's interesting, uh, not surprisingly, because for her, it's maybe memory of East Germany and the East German dictatorship that has more of an impact on her thinking than the memory of Nazism, which would make sense given her biography and everything like that. All right, um, so... As I mentioned at the outset, that's kind of the big picture. Uh, we've really seen an increase in the impact of the past, an increase in institutionalization, which I get into in the paper, but don't have time now. But there is some evidence that things have changed uh, more recently. So this is my attempt to try to quantify some of the things that we're talking about. So what I did is I did a keyword count. So I looked at by each year, the number of books that the German National Library, based in Frankfurt and also Leipzig, have in their online database. So it's one way to see how many books have been published in a given year, given an, with a, a, a specific keyword, uh, which is a proxy measure for these kind of trends, I think. And what you can see is you can see that, um, so the, th what the uh, second from the top is uh, the Holocaust. And as you can see, there was a big increase in books published, or at least obtained by this uh, German National Library, the Library of Record, in the mid-1990s. I think that really shows that this was uh, where interest in coming to terms with the past, interest in the Holocaust really kind of uh, peaked. And then we see a decline since then, um, and especially over the last few years, a further decline. But what's interesting is that some of the other um, uh, memories, the memory of German suffering, as I call it, or as other people call it the memory of Germans as victims, has also kind of declined. So one might argue that it's not just that what, one of the things that's changed in recent years is that interest and uh, the memory of the Holocaust has started to decline, but there might be a more general kind of global decline in interest in the past uh, in Germany, uh, perhaps indicating, indirectly at least, that uh, uh, Germany is becoming a more normal power, more interested in determination of self-interest based on you know, very pragmatic considerations uh, as opposed to uh, these specific influences from the past. The other thing to note too is that you know, um, time is, is brutal and vicious, it just keeps going on. And if you look at the biographies of major German uh, uh, policymakers, you can see that uh, it would also start to make sense that the past would matter less as the uh, events in question have less and less of a personal impact on policymakers' biographies. So as you can see, like let's go back to Westerwelle for a second. He was the uh, foreign minister between 2009 and 2013, uh, a, a liberal. Uh, Vestavella was, you know, 28 when communism fell, and he's currently over 50. I mean, Vestavella is uh, one of the youngest policymakers that, that have, has had a kind of impact. And, you know, he has zero kind of connection with the Nazi period. In fact, all of the most recent uh, chancellors and foreign ministers have had very little kind of biographical experience with these things. So generational change is something to take into consideration. As much as the Germans have institutionalized many of these uh, components of memory in uh, uh, a variety of respects, 
the fact that the generations now in power have no kind of connection to this is going to be uh, quite an issue. Uh, what's interesting is to look at Merkel. Um, I don't have um, Joachim Gauck. These are both Aussies, although I'm not sure that we're allowed to use that term anymore. They're both from the uh, former East Germany. And you can see that Merkel was, you know, uh, already well established at the age of 35 when communism fell. But for the for the uh, leaders that come next, they're not just going to have no connection to the Nazi period, biographical connection, but they'll also have very little connection to the period of German division as well. That's one of the things that I think is interesting, is if we were to look at German memory debates today, what we've seen is we've seen a rise of pluralism. Right, it, you know, from the 80s onwards, it was very clear that when people talked about the past in Germany, it was the Holocaust, right? Even though in the decades before that, and this is one of the things that frustrates me a little bit with um, some scholarship, uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about how, you know, in, during the Adenauer era, during these periods of more conservative memory politics, there was no memory. Right, but that's actually, I don't think, true. I think the Germans were dealing with other memories, uh, especially what I call the memory of German suffering. So anyway, but from the 80s onwards, I think it's pretty clear that the Holocaust was the memory that everybody talked about. Uh, so in recent years, what we've seen is we've seen you know, the maintenance of this interest in the Holocaust, maybe with a slight decline, but we've seen the rise of other memories. We've seen the return of this memory of German suffering. Uh, Gunter Grass and others were very important in uh, bringing this back to public attention in the early 2000s. We've seen the rise of other memories. East Germany, for instance, there was a lot of attention devoted to, what, the 40th anniversary of the erection of the wall, the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall, the 20th anniversary of German unification. So this new memory, which is also more proximate, is now competing with the Holocaust for influence in people's uh, policymaking. Uh, Merkel, for instance, has had major issues with uh, the NSA, as everybody probably knows. You know, every European that I know that has come to the United States in recent years, that's the first thing that they mention. The NSA scandal, oh my God. And Americans, at least in Washington, don't seem very kind of um, upset about that. But this is a big deal in Germany. And with Merkel, of course, it's probably the memory of the Stasi, right? And having lived in East Germany that is motivating her responses to this more than uh, the memory of the Nazis. So I guess I will conclude with, uh, with that, uh, that as much as Germany has been deeply imbued with this uh, culture of contrition, this desire to reconcile with former enemies, that it's become reason of state, we've seen in recent years the rise of certain trends, of certain phenomena uh, that might make this less the case going forward. The first is the kind of change of generations. We're now the second, third, maybe fourth generation past the Nazi period, the World War II era. Uh, we've seen the rise of other memories that are competing with memory of the Holocaust for discursive space and for uh, kind of influence on people's thinking. Uh, and the consequence of this is perhaps the rise of a, a new kind of normal foreign policy in Germany. And then I, I talk a little bit about the Euro crisis and the treatment of Greece as perhaps an example of this kind of new normal German policy. Many people have speculated, myself included, that had the Euro crisis happened, well, had the Euro happened earlier, but let's say 1999 instead of 2009, we might have seen very different responses. Uh, back then at the kind of high point of impact of this memory, uh, the Germans very well may have done what people said they should have done, which was to kind of open up the spigot and uh, send more money to you know, help Greece out. But by 2009 and onwards, I think that uh, we're starting to see a, a much more normal uh, German foreign policy, one that will kind of push through these kind of hard-nosed bargains, these hard-nosed diktats, and not worry as much about the consequences. But anyway, I will conclude there. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Schönen guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Anjung Hasmida, da da saa. It is my great pleasure to have been invited to attend this kind of uh, timely and uh, important, significant uh, conference. 
as a token token of uh, gratitude, I brought three sets of my publications. It is in German and Chinese. Uh, it's called the Chinese Images of Germany since 1870 until 1989. So I will present to our three honorable hosts, the East Asian Institute, the German Institute, and also the Korean Institute. It's rather heavy uh, to bring <laughs> to bring it uh, all over to from Taipei, to, Taipei to, to San Francisco, but still, it's uh, expression of my gratitude. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I just want to talk about the uh, the references of the inner German relationship to the cross strait, and uh, I want to make uh, make notice of the of my. Uh, results. That means the current cross trade relations are moving towards the German model. This is actually my um, observation and uh, my result, my findings. If we want to make com uh, references, I will spill it in two parts: the comparison of the present plus the post, uh, plus the past, and also the reference for the uh, for the future. I mean, I will divide it in two parts. A starting point, for instance, German Reich, das, Deutsch, das Deutsche Reich. What happened with that? And also the Chinese Civil War. The German Reich survived. I don't know if that will surprise you or not. German Reich has never uh, overthrown. overthrown. And, uh, but it was not able to act. This is the official stance of the German government to this date. That means there's a, yeah, how do you say, there's a vegetable, yeah? Like vegetable. It's a kind of a framework of the German Reich, but it cannot function. What does that mean? I will explain it later. But for instance, this is the German Reich in, in the year 1937. Uh, the East part, the East Germany, and West Germany. And now, Germany composes of only these two parts. Yeah? And these are yeah, in, 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 in the Russian uh, hands, and these are in the Polish hands. That's why I will say the framework of the two states in one nation is at its beginning already there. And the roof framework of the two German states also existent from the very beginning. But the Chinese case is different. The Qing Dynasty is non-existent since 1911. For the CCP, this is much more complicated because it never made clear what the relationship between Taiwan and China is, was and is. For instance, in the, in the 80s, they said they substitute the ROC. And in, in 2000, this has to be changed a little bit. One China means only PRC. ROC ceased to exist in 1949. And Hu Jintao has made a, something else, something, uh, something new, political confrontation of the civil war. What does that mean? Yeah, this is also a fussy, constructive fussy uh, situation. I made a comparison between the nations and states. That means, for instance, what, two nations and two states. That's, there was East Germany and a DPP from Taiwan, ideal type. That means Taiwan and China, for instance, they are two nations and also two states. Yeah, that's the, uh, what the uh, DPP had in, ha has in mind. And one country on each side, that's DPP, and no mention of Chinese nation. And one nation, two states, that's what West Germany, by that time, Willy Brandt, has proclaimed, and one nation, two regions. This is my interpretation of Ma Yingzhou, President Ma Yingzhou, and no mention of state. Otherwise, one state means ROC from, from uh, Taiwan's perspective, and one country, two systems, that's China, and one nation, one state, that's Sun Yat-sen. Yeah. They are all different. These are the combinations between nation and state. And the, in the German case, strong state for the First and Second World War ends up with catastrophe. That means 
uh, uh, one nation and two states could be the ideal solution for the German case. But for the Chinese case, it's totally opposite. Weak state leads to catastrophe. That's why one nation and one state, maybe it is more probable for the Chinese uh, people. And uh, in a foreign policy from China, there is a theology. There is only one China in the world. Taiwan is a part of China. And the PRC is the sole legitimate government of China. But since 2002, a kind of China roof was created. There's but one China, this is the same. And this sentence has been changed. Both mainland and China belong to China. And this, this is a kind of roof theory. That means the China, I mean, the whole China consists of two parts, PRC and ROC put together. And the Chinese sovereignty and integrity are indivisible. <clears throat> There's another uh, table that I have made uh, to extinguish to the, uh, the recognitions, the stages of the recognition. For instance, the ex explicit non recognition, total denial. That means total denial. FRG, the, uh, the West Germany and the East Germany, 49 to 69. And for China, 49 till 2008. An implicit recognition, mutual non-denial. That means they don't de deny the existence from the other side, ROC to PRC uh, since 2008. But PRC to ROC, we can discuss it. And semi-explicit uh, recognition, de facto recognition, um, for instance, international activities, Olympic Games, Chinese Taipei, uh, etc. And uh, semi-de jure recognition, FRG to GDR, 1969 till 1990, till the German uh, reunification. But on the other hand, from East Germany, East German side to West Germany, GDR to FRG, 1969 and 1990, they recognize the, the, I mean the GDR recognizes the FRG during this time as a foreign country. But from the uh, West German point of view, East Germany was never be treated, uh, treated as a foreign country. So that's the differences between the two German states of their stances. And the quintessence, I mean the, the major uh, content of the so-called 1992 consensus is just like, in my view, a Gretchenfrage. A Gretchenfrage is uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe you know the Faust. From Faust, yeah, the Gretchen is a, is a little girl. He poses the, the question to Faust, what's your take of the religion? And this is so essential for us. I mean, between Taiwanese and Chinese, what's your take of Chinese? For instance, that's the question that Beijing could have posed to us. Yeah? If you say we are foreigners, that will end all kinds of communications. But what if we want to go on explain, uh, developing our relationship? So we have also invented a kind of non-foreigner status. That means we are non-foreigners to each other. That's the minimum of consensus that both sides can make. Otherwise, there will be no fundament of communication between the two sides, Taiwan and China. If you say I'm a foreigner to China, then that's the end of the uh, communications. So that's why I will say falsification. Falsification means that we cannot verify what this one China is. So that's why at least we can falsify the content of the so-called one China. That means we are not foreigner, and China is not 
a foreign country to us. Otherwise, they will be very complicated. So that's the, actually the quintessence from 1992 consensus. And the developments since 2008, since President Ma Ying-jeou took office, has, proved, has been proven that the both sides has, have already accepted and the relationship, I would say, uh, go on rather smoothly because of this, because of this 1992 consensus. And because you cannot verify, as I just said, what one China mean, means. So that's why this one China could also be explained as a kind of belief, a political belief. Do you believe it? There's only one China. If you say, I believe it, okay, then it's, the problem can be solved. And as for what kind of content this one China could have, we can still discuss it. We can still negotiate it. And we can also wait and see what will come up. But if you say China is a foreign country and Chinese are foreigners to us, and then that will end all the conversations. <laughs> That's the differences between the, between the, I will say, between the KMT and the DPP. Because the DPP has never uh, expressed their position to accept the so-called 1992 consensus. <clears throat> and the national and reunification question, that's the, uh, one of the major centers of the uh, Gulag Vertrag, uh, the, uh, the basic treaty between the GR, FRG and the GDR in the year, in the early 1970s. And these indicates, actually, I would say the three major contents the same German past, because the East German ideology has led to the revolution, according to Marx, uh, that the new state of the GDR has nothing to do with the Nazi regime. This is their theory. Yeah? But for the, for, the, for the FRG, they inherited most of the legacy from the Nazis. For instance, the compensation to the Israels, yeah? But for the GDR, the story is totally different. But in this, this sentence, in the basic treaty, uh, has indicated that they really have some common past, yeah? And also agree to disagree uh, with both sides. And also, I find it very fascinating that they put lots of their dissents in a letter of German unification. Brief zur deutschen Einheit. That's, that's, I mean, this is a, this is a very genius uh, invention. Uh, for the Taiwanese and Chinese, for instance, uh, how Taiwanese people view the reunification and independence uh, stance. There's almost 56% they say status quo and permanent status quo. Taiwanese independence has about 25% of the people. And reunification only 7.7. It's very low. And Alain uh, Fetato's Anspruch, sole claim of representation for the KMT, mainland policy is much important than the foreign policy. That means if Taiwan wants to proceed its foreign policy, the basic or the prerequisite, the basic uh, <coughs> condition or the prerequisite must be a smooth relations with Beijing. But for the DPP, it's totally different. The foreign policy over mainland policy. <clears throat> That's the major differences between the two major parties. And the form and substance. I think this is also very important in, this, in the basic treaty. Because the verdict from the uh, Constitutional Court of, the, of, the, of Germany has made it clear that this treaty has two characteristics. From the type, this 
it is an international treaty, but in specific content, it, it, it regulates only the inter sea relationship <clears throat> between the two sides and the use of force. Use of force for the German case is a prerequisite, but for China, it's almost impossible because of the foreign interference, for instance, and the Taiwan identity. Most of the people, they consider themselves as Taiwanese, and only very, very few, they consider, or they still consider themselves as Chinese. That's the major differences. And now the Chinese nation, for instance, Chinese nation uh, composes of uh, ethnicity or ethnic identity and constructed factors. And the PRC plus ROC is only national identity and constructive factors. I can, or maybe if we have time, we can, uh, st I can still elaborate on this issue because most of the Taiwanese, as I just mentioned, they consider themselves as Taiwanese and they are not Chinese anymore. Yeah. And uh, what's the, uh, what's in, our, in the eyes of Taiwanese, which are mostly unacceptable uh, from the mainland Chinese, mainland Chinese uh, stance or policies is the international isolation, the first one, and uh, non-democracy and the rockets, rockets and missiles uh, uh, aiming at Taiwan and so on. <clears throat> and to my uh, conclusion, I will say for the German case, two states in one nation is actually a very common and acceptable uh, f structure for the German case in the, in the uh, 1980s until the, re uh, the reunification. And for Taiwan, or for the both sides of, of the cross street, Taiwan and China, 1992 consensus is so essential uh, for the both sides. And this is also a kind of roof framework uh, from the Taiwan-China case uh, emerges. And agree to, uh, to disagree also is a very useful instrument for us. And also, as I mentioned, the nation and state, the relationship between these two concepts. And to my conclusion, I will say politically, I'm Taiwanese, but culturally, I'm a totally Chinese. So that's why, and I, I got the uh, uh, stimulus from the, uh, from, the, from the German case, Kulturnation und Staatsnation, yeah? from, from these two concepts that could also be very useful for us to solve our problem of identity. And also, Hartstein Doctrine. Hartstein Doctrine means a Alleinvertretungsanspruch. That means uh, the sole claim of representation. Yeah? Because China, mostly the countries, they recognize China as the uh, only China, and no, only 22 countries of the world, they recognize the ROC as China. And since 2008, there's a kind of diplomatic truce between the two sides, Taipei and Beijing, but nobody knows what will happen uh, in, uh, in, in the future. Could that be a vicious cycle? I don't know. If the DPP will win the election uh, next January, the possibility is rather high uh, for a vicious cycle and constructive uh, ambiguity 1992 consensus. I would say this is the fundament, is the most important fundament of the uh, bilateral relations between Taiwan and China. And my last sentence will be that the cross-strait relations are now moving towards the German model, but we are still in the preliminary stage. There are lots of things that we can take references off, but still, we are just on the beginning, on the starting point, or on the starting phase of the German case. And that ends up my presentation, and I will welcome and invite uh, comments and questions uh, later on. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting to this conference, and I'm happy to be here. 
I have an opportunity to share ideas and perspectives with scholars from different countries. Uh, due to the limited time given to me, uh, I skip some parts of my manuscripts and go directly to the core ideas. Uh, the post-Cold War trend, prevalent throughout the world, is creating crevasses in the existing security structure of East Asia. Uh, however, unlike the Cold War hostility between the U.S. and the USSR, China-U.S. relations of today are double-sided, consisting of both cooperation and competition, and moreover, North Korea-China relations are not as strong as they uh, used to be. Uh, so, such circumstances in East Asia have an have read international relations in the region to play out in a very complex way and definable in linear terms. Uh, the goal of Obama administration's pivot to Asia policy is to ex effectively contain China, which is uh, ferociously flexing its muscles in all areas, including politics, economics, and military. It has been strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance and encouraging Japan to rearm. Under these circumstances, Japan is seeking to increase its military clout and transform itself from a world criminal state to a normal state. Uh, therefore, a conflict in any within uh, their corporate relationship manifest themselves not directly through their bilateral relations, but indirectly through uh, the East Asia region. North Korea nuclear helps legitimize U.S. strategy in East Asia, a strategy aimed at strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance and rearming Japan. Although the U.S. is in reality uh, targeting China, it uses North Korean military threats as a legitimate base for strengthening the trilateral security cooperation between South Korea, U.S., and Japan. Indeed, the vision is the most important cause of destabilization in the regional order. That also means that the process of overcoming division will be the road to making peace in the region. The so-called the Changbi group argued that abolition of the division system will not only resolve problems on the level of the Korean Peninsula, but will go far beyond to exert positive influence on establishing peace and solidarity in the region, as well as on forming an East Asian community. During the Cold War, it was difficult to bind and think of countries in East Asia as one regional unit because of the intense hostility in the region between the so-called Northern Triangle and Southern Triangle. At the end of the Cold War was not only an opportunity to recover the perception of East Asia as a region, but also an occasion to start searching for a new regional order. Among the socialist countries, China played the central role in reviving this East Asian perspective. Initially, the Changbi group used the concept of a division system coined by Peng Nakchong to deal with the divide, division issue. It's a unique system in which ruling powers in North and South Korea maintain not only an antagonistic confrontational relationship with one another, but also one of symbiosis, and which also has self-reproducing abilities. The focus on the reality of a, of a divided peninsula led the scholars to identify, identify East Asia as a middle category of mediation on a regional level between the division system and the world system. East Asia is an intellectual experiment that refers to the thought and praxis that East Asia should be seen, not a fixed entity, but as something that fluctuates in the process of self-reflection. It's a strategy to break away from both orientalist prejudices, and accidental obsessions, which both fundamentally 
differentiate the East and the West. East Asia is a reason, but at the same time, as the tendency to try to intervene in the transforming global capitalism. East Asia is a world historical reason that contains high potential to determine the direction of a world history rather than a unique regional one. The transforming the division system is in essential for building cooperation and peace in East Asia. A reason where an alternative to the capitalist world system can root down is one that satisfies the following four conditions. One, there is not to be a certain amount of accumulated capital. Second, uh, the existing method of capital accumulation has not become completely, completely solidified, but is still in flux. Third, it is an inevitable not that one day disaster and misfortune will strike as a result of maintaining existing ways. First, there is a sufficient level of alternative culture and civilization legacies to stimulate and support the course of alternative development. But in other points of view, uh, others have said that the theory reduced the device conflict and contradiction of East Asia to simply on peninsula issues. In other words, the emphasis on East Asia as a periphery in the world system and the emphasis on the Korean Peninsula as a periphery in the East Asia show the ends of privileging the periphery by excluding and objectifying other regions. The double periphery perspective is necessary to analyze the complex realities of East Asia located in the periphery on a world level, but at the same time has various center periphery relations within. The double periphery perspective, which assumes the existence of peripheries within East Asia, is the result of a reflection upon the fact that the East Asia theory can place prerogative on the Korean Peninsula or on the periphery in the process of positing East Asia as an alternative. It's from the position of the Korean Peninsula, which has reaped a passive destiny as a Chinese tributary, a colony, and a divided nation, that one can propose the right direction for East Asia to head in the future. The peninsula's peripheral position itself becomes a resistimate base. A concept of double periphery does not place absolute value on the center periphery relations, but rather seeks to find other peripheries like Okinawa of Japan and extends the center periphery relations into a continuous chain. This is not a building yet another center in counter to the existing one, but about deconstructing all centers internal and external. For example, open regionalism refers to coming up with ways to limit U.S. influence, which is the center of the peripheral East Asia. For example, too, as well as tearing apart the center periphery relations existing among members of East Asia. Now, talk about, I'll talk about uh, the compound state. The compound state is a concept with the widest range encompassing all sorts of combinations of states, including various federations and confederations, a unitary state. Uh, state is meant the compound state theory does not support the idea that a state is futile but rather calls for the creation of a structure with the strengths of a traditional nation state that plays a public role but, but once that is more democratized. In other words, 
it can be considered an example of the idea that in order to generously strive to overcome modernity, one must adapt to it. The form of the unified state on the Korean Peninsula has, not, has to be a compound state and that though the compound state needs to be based on exclusive sovereignty. It should not be a, a unitary nation state in which only the citizens of a peninsula are considered political uh, constituents. The compound state theory is not only a method of overcoming the division system, but is also an alternative that provides a new framework of cooperation and solidarity in East Asia. For example, the compound state theory can also become a helpful reference point in resolving the so-called cross-street relations between mainland China and Taiwan, as well as challenge within Japan's idea of nation-state, as in the case of Okinawa. Uh, in conclusion, the dismantling the division system will provide an opportunity for the crippled East Asia to rise in a new form of solidarity and become an important step in opening up a new, po new post-Cold War era. The Korean Peninsula has a double implication. It's the touch point between the US and China and thus uh, epic center of regional instability. Efforts to overcome the division system will have very important uh, repercussions on the dominant structure of East Asia. In this sense, constructing a peace regime on the peninsula and overcoming the division system are preconditioned to building a regional peace regime and community. Therefore, dismantling the division, division system and unifying the Korean Peninsula have the following uh, implications for peace and coexistence in East Asia. First of all, in a situation where the U.S.-China standoff is showing signs of a new Cold War and considering the fact that this Cold War manifests itself through the division of the peninsula, the dismantling of the division system, and building a peace raising between the two Koreas will provide an opportunity for the neo Cold War uh, disintegrated. At the moment, the neo Cold War is developing in the form of the Southern Triangle, consisting of South Korea, Japan, and US, surrounding and containing North Korea. Countries in the West believe they can maintain their control over North Korea through China, but they are mistaken. North Korea is a country with a strong sense of self-pride. Moreover, the North in the retaliation against the containment is putting everything online. A mouse with nowhere to hide eventually attacks the cat. One first move in trying to contain the North can read it to make a rash judgment. Therefore, a way to attain peace would be to seek politics of a comprehensive compromise in the form of North Korean giving up its nuclear arms in exchange of forging diplomatic ties with the U.S. Second, dismantling the division system on the peninsula can directly lead to to East Asia overcoming the imperialist inventions and hegemonic rivalry it had experienced during the 20th century and also to exploring ways to build a regional community. External forces had intervened in the cre creation and later in the development of the division system 
and still continue to exert influence on East Asia. No country among the US, Russia, China, and Japan is free from historical liability in regard to the division of the peninsula. The Korean peninsula is a narrow war crimes nation, unlike Germany, which started the Second World War. In East Asia, the war crimes nation is Japan. In this regard, the division of the peninsula is a primary example of the unjust way the situation was handled internationally after World War II. Therefore, dismantling the division system can pave the path to overcoming the entire history of imperialist inventions beyond East Asia to encompass even the Western Hemisphere. Third, Dismantling the division system will lay the foundation for a new world order to be created one that links East Asia and Europe, which are at the moment severed as a result of the division. The European Union and Asia are linked into a continent, uh, into one continent. However, imperialist inventions and the Cold World regime divided the continent and instigated the hostility between the East and the West. Uh, the two sides were unable to provocatively share their differences. Globalization is de demanding that East and the West meet and engage in dialogue, and the disintegration of the Cold War regime has paved the way to make this possible. The main obstacle, however, is division. Overcoming division may provide an opportunity for a new global network to be formed, encompassing Japan, South and North Korea, China, Russia, and the EU. In this sense, dismantling the division system of the Korean Peninsula is indeed directly linked to world peace and coexistence. Thank you for listening. So now, um, Steph Haggard and I will make a few comments and keep our comments short so that we can have um, some discussion in the audience. So Steph, you go first and I will follow. Okay, well, thanks very much uh, to Bev and the centers for organizing this. It's a really fascinating uh, conference and, and set of papers. So. Um, my comparative advantage is in talking about the East Asian papers, so I think I'll start with those, but I want to say something about the Japan-Germany comparisons at the end. So let me take up Professor Kim's paper first. Um, the first thing, for those of you who don't work on Korea or are familiar with Korea, it's important to understand that the issues of how to deal with North Korea and coincidentally how to think about the alliance are actually highly politically salient. Um, they, they define, uh, to some extent, the central political cleavages in, uh, in Korea between the, the center left and the center right. So this is, um, this is an issue which is played out politically um, quite centrally. And I think that's true increasingly in Taiwan as well. Um, so uh, this is a paper which is really about um, a particular a group of intellectuals on the left um, that emerged in the immediate post-transition period that are, that are called the Changbai Group. And um, just to put the paper in a little bit of sociology of knowledge perspective, um, this is a group that was extremely influenced by the events of Kwangju in, in 1980, in which um, the US, I think, effectively stood aside while uh, Chen Duan uh, managed to prolong Park Chung hees dictatorship for another six years. And the result of that event was a tremendous amount of bitterness about what role the alliance had played in supporting Park Chung hee generally, but very specifically in, in this uh, episode in which uh, South Korea was subjected to, in my view, an unnecessary additional six years of dictatorship. Uh, and so there was a tremendous amount of bitterness as a result of that, particularly on the left. And this was reflected in divisions within the student movement about the extent to which the alliance and the approach to the north was really the driving wedge of going after 
um, the, the dictatorship or whether the, the opposition movement should focus more on domestic class, class struggle. And, the, and these, are, these are left groups. These are openly left groups, and in one case, identifying very closely with, with uh, North Korea. Um, uh, these, are, these ideas also, I think, have a, have a larger pro, uh, provenance in the region, even though there's not a direct lineage from, from these ideas that grew out of the Bangdong Conference in 1955 to the Changbai group. But the idea that, that Asia would somehow be better off if it could be freed, not just from Western intervention in imperialism, but also from the Cold War more generally. Uh, and the spirit of Bandung concept um, coming out of that 1955 conference and extending through to a, a direct lineage to people like Mahathir and ideas that are embedded in ASEAN are really looking for some kind of way out of uh, the Cold War more generally and particularly American involvement uh, in it. So that's, that to me is the sociology of knowledge of this paper. And the paper has, uh, I, I can't tell, uh, Professor Kim is both committed to these ideas, but he's also reporting on what they are. And um, uh, to just sharpen uh, disagreements and have a debate, I'm not particularly sympathetic with this, with this uh, view. Um, and one of the things I want to focus on is a difference that I'll talk about later today, um, uh, but also with respect to Taiwan, which is the difference of thinking about the divided nation concept in terms of the end state. That is, what is it that the end state might look like? How would it be structured? Are we talking about absorption or federalism or some sort of alternative long run equilibrium sets of, of relationships? versus the process through which you get to whatever that end state might be. And it might seem silly to say that we should talk about process separate from end state, but some processes that are stipulated, you actually can't get to the end state. And, un and some end states which are postulated, you can't get to at all, frankly, in my view. And so um, we have to be cognizant of, of these two uh, features of discussing possible futures for these divided countries. So, um, the question I pose to the Changbai group is just, what is the theory that tells you that we can get to the end of the division system? I mean, simply saying that the division system should end is a goal that no one would, would contest. It's, it's, it's mother's milk. Uh, the question is really uh, how you get there. And, and I think that what the Changbai group uh, and, and those on the center left more generally think is that you're more likely to get there through a process which involves engagement between the South and the North. Um, and that engagement uh, would take a variety of forms. I mean, these are ideas which are subsequently articulated most, in my view, most coherently by Kim Dae-jung and less coherently by No Mu Hyun. But they have to do with some process of easing tensions and detente as a first step towards something which we don't know what it's really going to look like, but we can't get there unless we at least take the steps of trying to have some sort of uh, engagement. Now, um, uh, the current incarnation of this idea, which I think enjoys support beyond the type of groups that uh, Professor Kim talks about in his paper, is the idea that's been proposed by the North and picked up by some prominent intellectuals in the South, including my good friend Chung and Moon, which is that we should move towards the signing of a peace treaty on the peninsula. And the idea of, of, of uh, and again, this is, this is well known, there, there's no peace treaty on the peninsula. We basically are living with the armistice, which is a military uh, negotiation and a military document that was a ceasefire, in effect, and established the demilitarized zone. But there's no rec formal recognition of the United States, or Japan, for that matter, of, of North Korea. And that by reaching a peace regime uh, first, then this would be a critical step towards moving towards some sort of reconciliation on the peninsula. Now, uh, the first thing I want to say about this, and I, I, I you know, uh, pardon me for being blunt, is this is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen because no American president is going to sit down uh, and negotiate a peace regime with North Korea in the context of North Korea continuing to maintain its nuclear program. It's just not going to happen. Uh, at best, I could imagine uh, some kind of parallel process in which the North Koreans would return to the six-party talks, which itself would be a difficult thing for them to do. And then in conjunction with the negotiations of the six-party talks and with some progress on those six-party talks, with the North Koreans making credible moves towards relinquishing their nuclear program, including 
saying openly that they are willing to relinquish their nuclear program. I could see that happening. But the sequence of putting a peace regime first uh, prior to some resolution of the nuclear issue, I think is, is just, it's not likely to happen. And so um, when I see things like the, uh, the compound state idea, and Kim Dae-jung in his earlier days advanced ideas like this of some sort of federal system, I don't see them as real um, proposals about what will ultimately transpire. I see them more as signals to North Korea about the willingness to engage North Korea. Because essentially the signal you're sending when you're talking about a compound state is we're willing to allow you to maintain the system that you have in place in the course of thinking about what unification may ultimately look like. And I should say it's extraordinarily difficult for South Koreans to do that, even on the left. Because uh, as President Park's Dresden speech shows, she's in this tremendous bind of trying to jumpstart a trust politic process on the peninsula, while at the same time, she clearly believes that the ultimate resolution of the Korean conflict is going to be the absorption of the North by the South, which is what the German model ultimately is. And so it's very difficult to maintain those two paths uh, simultaneously. So at least I, I hope... I hope I didn't offend Professor Kim, but this will at least start a debate on what the prospects are for going to a peace regime. Uh, let me turn to the Tongue paper, um, which is, is just an extraordinarily nuanced uh, discussion of the legal formula and, and, and process by which uh, cross-strait relations have uh, evolved. And let me go to the central claim, which again, I, I want to dispute, which is that we're in an early stage of moving towards something that looks like the German model. Um, and um, to, again, to just sort of spark the, sharpen the, 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 the differences, uh, let me just start with some obvious things that are quite different in these relationships. The first is that, is just size. It's, it's, it's hard to, to think about these processes without taking into account that the democratic side of the cross-strait uh, uh, dynamic is tiny. It's a province of China in China's eyes. And so its ability to exercise leverage over the process is, is very much constrained by, by that fact. Um, but um, now, it's, it, it, one of the things very interesting in the paper is there's a discussion of how Ostpolitik, this, this process of reconciliation, was actually, um, and this is going back to the Park Dilemma as well, was accompanied by a very clear statement on the part of the Federal Republic that it saw absorption of, the, of, of, of East Germany as the ultimate likely end of this process. And the East Germans accepted that because they thought it was better to move forward with Ostpolitik than it was to be isolated. But it's very interesting to remember uh, that fact. But um, uh, Ostpolitik obviously gave rise to the end of the Hallstein Doctrine, which it in any case faded. But, but um, cross-state relations, you know, it has a lot of complications which don't look like Germany to me. Um, you know, first of all, uh, um, China couldn't completely limit Taiwan's international space because of the United States, basically. That is the Taiwan Relations Act, Reagan's Six Assurances, and, and so on. Um, but uh, China has tried to uh, severely restrict Taiwan's international space and has been quite successful in doing so, frankly. Um, with respect to membership in international organizations, that's very well known. Um, it, it should be remembered that unlike the German case, uh, the Chinese have actually used force with respect to Taiwan in the 1995-96 Strait Crisis. Interestingly, to maintain the status quo, not to change it, they just didn't want the Taiwan independence movement wing of the DPP to gain greater strength and disrupt the status quo. But um, more importantly, um, the Chinese have issued extraordinarily nuanced um, documents about what they actually see the end state like. And I think uh, in this case, I'm going to focus more on the end state and look for, uh, back to the, the process, because I think this is an issue on which uh, Professor Tong and I might uh, disagree. Uh, one document in that regard, which is mentioned in the paper, is the 2005 anti-succession law. But I think that everyone who's interested in cross-strait relations uh, should read a, a document that the Chinese produced in 2014 called The Practice of One Country, Two Systems Policy in Hong Kong SAR, in Hong Kong SAR. 
Because this document basically outlines in an extraordinarily intelligent and cogent way precisely how China sees the relationship between China and Hong Kong. And it is not one roof, guys. It is not one roof in the sense that there are two systems under this one roof. It states there are two systems in which one is completely subordinated to the other. Uh, and, uh, and it does so in a very interesting legal way, which I won't go into in detail, but basically what it says is that all powers which are exercised under the basic law in the Hong Kong SAR are delegated from Beijing to Hong Kong. From Beijing to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has no, and I emphasize no, residual powers. That's what the umbrella movement was about. It was trying to assert that Hong Kong had residual powers under the basic law. And China said, no, Hong Kong does not have residual powers under the basic law. It is our intention to guide this process. So, so uh, I think the end state there, in China's eyes, very clear. Is, and so the question is that China, the difficulty that China has is really a tactical one, which is that has been stated. And so how does this relationship get managed in the interim? And I have, again, a slightly different reading of the 1992 Singapore consensus, because in my view, what the Singapore consensus states is, we're not going to talk about this in normal relations across the strait. We're not going to talk about the issue of one China in normal relations across the strait. Uh, that would only come up in extraordinary circumstances where we see some uh, crisis at uh, work. Now, I'm going to close. I wanted to say something about uh, Germany, Japan, but I, I'm, I don't have time to do that. So let me just uh, say one more thing about the process of economic integration across the strait, because I think the Chinese are, have faced a quite rude shock uh, over the last several years with respect to how the long game of integrating Taiwan is likely to play out in, in Taiwan cross-strait politics. So the long game is basically that the KMT has opened itself quite dramatically to increase cross-strait relations and integration. And um, that has created this period of tremendous you know, goodwill in cross-strait relations. And the reason this meeting is taking place this next week, in my view, is because the Chinese leadership is very concerned that that might be disrupted, and they want to use the meeting to lock in commitments that had been made under the Mangzhou administration into the DPP period, which is almost certain to transpire, at least if the polls are currently right. But um, the results of cross-strait integration have not worked out among the Taiwanese public as opposed to the KMT in the way that was predicted. Number one, more Taiwanese, uh, and by Taiwanese I mean citizens of the ROC, identify themselves as Taiwanese than they did six years ago. And you're, you show this very clearly in your paper. I mean, it's really interesting. Those who say we're Taiwanese going up, right? Uh, number two, um, familiarity, uh, as much as I believe in student exchanges and the like, doesn't necessarily lead to us thinking that these other people are like us. It makes us realize that they're different from us, which is a good thing in my view. That's fine, you know, but not if you're a one China person. Um, and then finally, there's a very interesting political economy component to this, which I think has been uh, missed um, in a lot of the discussion, is that the differences between the KMT and the DPP really hinged centrally and historically on differences over the relationship with the mainland and Taiwanese identity. But as a result of integration, the DPP is becoming a center-left party precisely because integration with China is having adverse effects on the distribution of income in China, uh, in Taiwan. And the result of that is opposition to closer integration with the mainland, not only on political grounds, but because of a concern about the fact that this integration is going to have adverse economic effects. And that was what the Sunflower Movement was in large part about. And the Sunflower Movement last year managed to block the signing of the services agreement, which was going to be the next step in bilateral integration. So uh, at least that gives us something to fight about. But these are really great papers. And uh, it was a pleasure to be able to comment on. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Steph. I, I am going to be short. We're, we are running out of time. 
Um, although everybody kept to their time, it just takes a long time. And so I, I think that um, Steph said a few things that I actually wanted to say so I can make my, my comments more brief. But I wanted, I wanted to actually, and my comparative advantage is the German case, of course, but I was fascinated by these, by these two papers that dealt with the Asian case. And it strikes me that if I start with Professor Kim, this division system, the paper was inspiring to me, despite the criticisms that Steph had. They, I, I was thinking this division system is never talked about in the European context when we're talking about about Germany, and I think there was there was so much uh, overlap between the division systems, and this division system idea really explains a lot of what happened during the Cold War and in in Europe. And so, even though this is an Asian perspective, it really does relate to Europe. I I think it does, especially in the Cold War. We had. Um, we had bipolarity and hierarchy. The U.S. and the Soviet Union were the superpowers, and beneath them were were their alliance alliance partners. And Germany had to operate within that division system. And it also that system reproduced national division, as Professor Kim said. So, so in a way. Um, it was the Cold War, and the beginnings of the Cold War that led to the division of Germany and the division of Germany that actually intensified the Cold War. And so these, this division system became more and more and more in, entrenched. Also, um, because this panel is about the impact of division on stability, I think we should look at the Cold War as fostering tremendous instability in the world. Many observers want to wax nostalgic about the Cold War and the current situation and, you know, long for the Cold War to come back. But in fact, um, it wasn't really a stable system with two, two powers balancing each other. In the periphery of the periphery, to use Professor Kim's language, um, we, had, we had tremendous wars. Um, from from Vietnam to Laos to Cambodia, Angola, Nicaragua, Lebanon, I could go on and on. In Indochina alone, five million people lost their lives. And when you look at the periphery of the center, that is the United States and Europe, this division system was, was dominated by the threat of nuclear war, uh, mutual assured destruction, MAD, which was supposed to be considered a, um, a stable system um, because, you know, we were, there was a standoff and there wasn't a nuclear war. That doesn't prove that it couldn't have happened. It could have happened at any point. And we all lived under that illusion that it couldn't happen. Um, and hundreds of people died trying to escape from the East. We had the whole surveillance system in both East and West Germany and repressive police systems. So this wasn't necessarily a stable, the Cold War wasn't a stable system. I think if Professor Kim would, would take this Chong Bai group's arguments and apply it to Europe, it would, it would have really been a good, a good description. Um, and I would like to know if you would agree that it could apply, even though you have said that it's just a, an, an, you know, it's an East Asian perspective. Um, the prescription for peace, Steph talked about this a little bit. It begins with reconciliation between divided nations, but it seems to me in a division system of hierarchy that the reconciliation um, is going to be dependent on whether the dominant powers in the hierarchy agree. And, agree. and this is what Steph was talking about when he said, there's gonna be no way that a US president would ever agree to a peace treaty with, between, the, between the two Koreas. And, and actually, in the European case, there, and the treaty, the 1972 treaty that Professor Tang describes, we had a few steps, Germany had a few, West Germany had a few steps that went, that led up 
to the Treaty of 1972 with East Germany. First, there was a treaty with Moscow. So West Germany uh, approached the other superpower. Then there was a treaty with Poland. And finally, there could be a treaty with East Germany. So within the, the hierarchy of the division system, West Germany played its cards right. However, the interesting thing is that, that Brandt did not deal openly with the United States about his Ostpolitik. So he went around, around the backs of Kissinger and, and Nixon and others to, to deal with East Germany and did not ask permission. Um, and, I and, and Kissinger was very angry about this. This was, also, this was a period in which Dutch detente was flowering. But nonetheless, um, he did make a bold move to overcome the larger division system and confront the hierarchies. Um, so I think that, I think that this Professor Kim's paper goes a long way in, in trying to help us understand the division system in Europe and, ha and how it had to be overcome. Now, Professor Tong's paper lets us know in some ways he has made an argument that it can be overcome. It was overcome in the European and the German case, and one could apply that to the Chinese case. But, and I read this paper three times, and the first two times, I agreed with you. And the third time, I said, I had to agree with Steph. Because, because I think what, what, you, what, what the paper does tell us it, that, is that there are these tremendous obstacles to, obstacles to reconciliation and unification. Germany had overcame these obstacles. And, in the Chinese case, the obstacles have not been overcome. I found, I found actually four obstacles. One, that um, if one side claims to speak for the entire nation, the whole thing will fall apart. Um, that it's a major obstacle to mutual recognition. And so what happened in the German case is that West Germany backed down from, from the claim to represent the entire nation and, and engaged in mutual recognition, saying two states, one nation, and the nation then was the Kulturnation, I think, is what, what they were referring to. And so that was, that was a very important point that happened. This has not happened in the, in the case between China and Taiwan. Um, if you don't have mutual, secondly, if you don't have mutual recognition, you, can, you can't have reconciliation. And we have seen that Germany achieved this mutual recognition, whereas it hasn't, maybe this ambiguity is important, but it hasn't been achieved in, in the case between China and Taiwan. This mutual recognition has to somehow, at least if we're following the German model, that, that absolutely has to happen. Um, and third, very important here in terms of stability, um, Germany renounced the use of force. West Germany renounced the use of force. And interestingly enough, as Steph mentioned on the Korean Peninsula, there hasn't been really a peace treaty. There was never a, a peace treaty for World War II in Europe until after 1990. So, so all along, Europe was in this limbo state where there was no peace treaty after World War II, and therefore the use of force was always kind of on the back burner, always ready to be used. But what happened in the 1972 treaty is that Brandt said, no, we will renounce the use of force. And that was crucial, and China has not been able to do this and won't do this probably. And I think they won't do it because of something that you said in your paper you didn't mention in your talk that, that um, China's looking at its own regions like Tibet uh, in which like it, more autonomy for Taiwan is going to encourage these border regions to seek to also seek autonomy, and China can't really afford that, and so I think that's another huge obstacle that you know that we have to face. And then finally, the identity obstacle. You know, East Germany tried to have a socialist 
identity. He said, we are different. You are capitalist, fascist pigs over there in the West, and we are socialists. We have community. We have solidarity. We are a different, we are really a different people, but no one bought it. The, the East Germans just didn't, didn't buy that. Um, and so there was never a sense that there was a particular East German national identity that the East Germans could, could adhere to, no matter how hard they tried. So, and then, and we see this, you know, this, this is very powerful, your, your statistics on Taiwanese identity. And uh, it seems to me that that's an obstacle that can't be overcome. Briefly to, uh, Fania's paper and Eric's paper. I, these papers are wonderful and I encourage everyone to read them. <laughs> they, they are, but what we should have had in this conference, and I knew this, but it just was make it too long, is the Japanese case. Because we have no basis for comparison with the, the, the Korean case, the Chinese case. These were not perpetrators of war and Germany started World War II. And you know, as, uh, in Europe, Japan started World War II in Asia. And these are countries that lost the war and they were forced into contrition as perpetrators. And it's that memory of being a perpetrator that, that Eric's paper so beautifully describes that, that Germany has said never, never again um, will will we do this? this I think this, this informs the whole Merkel's ideas about accepting refugees. Um, but that's, that's you know, neither here nor there right now. I, I do think, though, that I disagree with Eric. I hope, and we don't know because we're talking about the future here, that, that this mem he does give us in the paper, if you were, his paper's wonderful to read, that, that this memory culture has been institutionalized and has been institutionalized in the sense that after all these old guys have died, it still persists and Merkel is still acting on this. And I, I think it's a glass, glass half full, glass half empty argument. It seems to me that the institutionalization is very important. It's also institutionalized in the German constitution, which, which is held very, very sacred. So I, you might, you might want to counter me on this. And finally, for Fania's paper, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful bird's eye view of how an extremely rocky road towards reconciliation can be traveled and, and an end state could be reached. Um, an end state of reconciliation, which, um, which, which she describes basically as a people-to-people exchange or not exchange but more informal civil society exchange I don't think this could have been possible without the 1952 um, odd hours 1952 offers of compensation and recognition not not formal recognition but recognition without what the official German position has been and that's hugely important but you have also said that it could happen without that official, official sort of you know um, stance of yes, we give you we give our blessing and we will help. I don't know. I w would really be curious to know if you believe that this is possible in the Asian case with, without an, a a kind of umbrella um, recognition. Rescindance of the idea that one that one side represents one nation, um, and so I think I should stop there, and we should have a few questions before. And I won't let you guys um, respond yet, but because I want to get people from the audience to maybe ask a couple of questions, and then we'll see if you, we can respond. Anybody. Or maybe you're just you just would like like okay yeah. Could I just raise a, uh, I think raise a general kind of, of challenge that would involve dialectical thinking, but I think it makes a lot of sense to. Uh, it's not on. I I, I think it makes oh, a lot of sense to 
uh, use the German unification model as a lens to look at these Asian crises, like the China-Taiwan crisis. But why not, for purposes of dialectical comparison, also use the Soviet Union model? I mean, why wouldn't it make sense to think about China actually dividing up into separate states? Taiwan would be one state, Tibet would be another, and so on. I mean, it seems to me that maybe the process of getting there is difficult, but why, why wouldn't that be a reasonable comparison, too? Interesting comment. Anybody else? Yeah. I think Hans. Thanks. I wanted to ask um, Fanny a question um, about the um, the sort of trajectory of the German-Israeli re relationship that you described, um, which I mean I didn't agree, didn't disagree with anything you said, but I wondered whether um, there's there's a, a sort of another part of this relationship that often isn't discussed, um, and this goes to the question of what drove the very strong relationship that you now describe. Um, but it also goes to the question of how this relationship develops in future um, and, and whether, it, that, you know, it, whether, whether it's going to continue to remain as strong as it is. Um, it strikes me that, there, in a way, when you think about the, the, the German-Israeli relationship, it's a slightly schizophrenic relationship in the sense that, on the one hand, there's the very public narrative um, um, of um, contrition driving reconciliation. Um, but there's something puzzling about that in the sense that, firstly, um, the Luxembourg Agreement, for example, in 1952, took place way before Germany even begins to engage with the Nazi past, as Eric was describing. And then also the way that some of the figures associated with it, I think always of Franz Josef Strauss, you know, is not necessarily the type of person you would, uh, would identify with Germany's engagement with the Nazi party. He's famous for the quote, a country that has you know, made the economic achievements that, that we have has the right never to hear about Auschwitz again. And yet he was one of the driving forces in this relationship. So there's something slightly odd about this relationship. And so what I suppose my point is, I wonder whether actually there's a sort of a secret side of this relationship, um, which isn't talked about um, certainly in the German debate, which is actually much more to do with German interests, beginning, um, you know, as we've already mentioned, with the need for rehabilitation. Um, that was a German interest after the Cold War, for example, the need to subsidize the German um, submarine <laughs> industry. You know, the, the, the supply of German submarines to Israel was, was, was partly a subsidy for the German arms industry. And, and this is not really discussed very much in Germany, which I think is part of the reason why now, that as Eric, in the way that Eric described, the traction of the Holocaust as a driver for this relationship is starting to weaken. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for Germans to see why um, it, it should be in Germany's um, national interest to um, stand up for Israeli security. So I worry a little bit about the future of the relationship, partly for that reason. Okay, good, Hans. And uh, Lily has a comment. Lily. Okay. I think my comments actually follow on from yours. And first to Fania, um, what's interesting today is that there's Hold a it closer. Closer, closer. So is that there's a difference between the government's policy towards Israel and public opinion. Um, and I think that's very important with the government quite steadfastly being supportive of Israel. I mean, it has differences, criticisms of um, policy toward the Palestinians, but overall the government's policy is, is, a, is a supportive one, whereas public opinion, if we look at public opinion polls, is highly negative and as expressed in demonstrations, for example. Um, but that brings me to, I think, what is a central point that we have to see a difference, and you make this point, between civil society organizations and public opinion. And if you look at civil society organizations, they provide the long view. And I think a more reliable um, manifestations of how Germans as individuals or as groups see the past. And the, the reality is that this relationship was built by civil society. I mean, diplomatic relations didn't occur until 1965, but you had youth exchange, you had media exchanges, you had trade union exchanges. 
You had scientists in the 1950s. You had Axion Zunitzeichen. All of that, which we could call expressions of civil society commitment, were before the officials. So I think your point about civil society is, is absolutely relevant. Good. And, and, oh, and the sorry. second point to Eric, I think it's very important, and I think Hans was mentioning this too, to look at the motives in this relationship. And I would argue that the motives, that you've kind of put it in a binary sense of, well, first it was the Holocaust, and now that's less so. Um, and now it's more pragmatic, more related to self-interest. In fact, self-interest was there from the very, very beginning. And that was Adenauer's, um, that was his real uh, strength that he was able to combine a moral imperative with a highly, highly pragmatic reason for the reparations agreement. Germany would not have been rehabilitated. The contractual agreements would never have been signed if Germany had not um, concluded the reparations agreement. So I think if you look at those motives originally, it's more a question of balancing them, not one in the past and another one now. But there's always been a balance and that's gone up and down depending on leadership and political constellations. And that brings a, you know, it makes it messier today to understand, but I think maybe, you know, more accurate. Okay, I, I'm afraid we have run out of time, and I, I very much appreciate these comments because I think Steph and I both gave short shrift to the, to the first two papers. <coughs> and um, I think we will be able to mingle with the, um, with the speakers and, and talk to them too. And we'll have an a extremely short break. If you would like to you know, run out to the bathroom and grab, a, grab something to munch on or a cup of coffee and come back, then we'll, start, we'll try to start close to 11. <laughs>